everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of uh, our wonderful conference. Ha I'm, I'm sorry, but hasn't it been bloody great? Yeah. It's, it's been great. It's been great because honestly, all of you are fucking great. And I think it's just been wonderful. And I'm just so happy to know all of you. And thank you so much for coming. And uh, let's get on with this panel, which is um, on blasphemous women touching the sacred. And in this panel, we've got a group of wonderful women. Uh, the first, who you've heard from before, her poem, Shook Us All, Halima Salat. If she can join us. Oh, gosh, don't tell me Halima's not even here. <laughs> OK, she's coming. Um, she's a poet and a journalist. Uh, you've also seen this amazing film uh, uh, that we watched, uh, was it yesterday, on uh, Nadia Alfani's work. Um, she's a Tunisian filmmaker and an artist and an activist. Yes, please, Nadia, join us. And uh, we also have uh, Yasmin. Is Yasmin here? Oh. Uh, we also were uh, moved and touched and felt the power of Yasmin's wonderful work and her words as well. Um, and finally, we've got, there's Halima. Yeah, take your time. We've only started 15 minutes late. And the brilliant Halima Salats, come on. <laughs> and of course, uh, last but not least, uh, this wonderful woman, I mean, honestly, um, all of you are so wonderful, but this wonderful woman, Nazmi Oral, who... And, and of course, Zara Kay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Zara Kay, who is the founder of Faithless Hijabi and been emceeing, and you've got to know her so well. I, s I see how it goes when you're up here. You, you get really flustered, don't you, and make 20,000 mistakes. So sorry about that. And there's the wonderful Nazmia. Now, um, Nazmia is uh, an actor, and she's, uh, um, she's, a f she's uh, made a film uh, with, uh, uh, with it, about a conversation with her mother. Um, and she's also started uh, the Zena Foundation. She's done a lot of work around women's rights. And this film, uh, No Longer Without You, is a film about her refusing to accept to live life without her family, her religious family. So the insistence that I will no longer live without you. Um, and I always, I'm so touched by this film. I always, it always makes me hysterical crying. Uh, but we, obviously we don't have the time to show the whole film, but we're going to show a clip of this film before we go into, uh, because it helps us open the conversation. And this is a section of the film which talks about Nazmia's abortion to her mother and her brother and sister. So let's watch this video clip to begin with. I want to from van het offer van mijn eenzaamheid. Ik ging trouwen en ik was zwanger geraakt. Ik dacht meteen, dit kan niet. Een moeder die ik helemaal kapot maak, dierlijk aan de klem probeert duidelijk te maken, voor jullie staat geen gewond Je moet nu niet denken dat je mij kapot kan maken. En ik dacht, dit kan niet, dit kan niet. Ik heb het weg laten halen. Jammer, zulde. Maar wel dat is een beetje... Ja, nee. Bebeen, çocuk bebeen babasından evlendirdim bir an evvel. Altından kalkabilirdik, bilmiyordum. Bir de benim için hep diyorum ya, reykhuslar önemli, reykhuslar önemli. İşte reykhuslar uysaydın böyle bir şey başına gelmezdi. O yüzden bencilsin işte. Tesnih maklı. O yüzden bencilsin işte. Siz maklı. Ya türlü kes maklı bu ya. Bencil. Ulan hep iyi yürü ufukdan. Sehtan. Ne yapıyor ki bu da olsun? Ulan hep iyi yürü ufukdan. 
tegen ons te kunnen praten. Heel lang. Ja, heel lang. Ja. Jaren. Jaren. En dan verwacht je van mij dat het fucking makkelijk is binnen een week. Dat hij dat moet accepteren. Dan had je het ja. jaren geleden jij, moeten doen. Alsjeblieft, jij, jij gaat Hallo. wel met een beetje benzine op het vuur af, vind ik. Ja, sorry, vind ik wel. Oké. Okay. Ben je een beetje in de neem, Jonsson? Tamam mı? Sen diyorsun ya, benim hayatım bu. Bana saygı duy. Doğru mu? Bütün bu şeyler bu değil mi abla? Ne? Tamam. Bana saygı duy Sa- diye bu, değil. Beni, tamam, hani birleşelim, şey yapalım. Ama that is not for any count, Beyce. Tamam mı? Bizim hayatımızda bu. Ya. Tamam mı? Sevsek de sevmesek de, şey yapsak da yapmasak da bizim hayatımız bu. Ya. Tamam mı? Sen de, tamam mı? Maklıkmış gibi konuşamazsın. Tamam mı? Anneyi tam ik weet niet wat je van tevoren hani ne konuştuğunuz ya. bilmiyorum şey yapmıyorum tamam mı? Ama ya. tamam mı? Hani e, ben ilk defa duyuyorum bazı evet. şeyleri. Tamam mı? Ik neem aan o da ilk defa duyuyor. Ik neem aan yengem de ilk defa ben duyuyor. Misschien iedereen hier. Weet ja, je? ik ook. Dan denk ik, dan vind ik, weet je? Dat je ook aan mama moet denken. Ja, weet je? Precies. Want jullie praten over een omgeving waar ja. ze in leeft. Weet je? Waar jij het zo moeilijk mee hebt. Weet je, waar wij het moeilijk mee hebben, ja, en dan verwacht je van haar dat, dat het heel, ja, dat heb ik gedaan. Dat dat gelijk. Van, daarvan. Weet je, ja. ik vind dat niet kunnen. Ja. Benji, Benji, de oma's. En dan zeg ik, ja, Benji is Ja, zoals een beetje, Benji liet door te zeggen, eerst zeggen, dat is voor hem. Hier, bijvoorbeeld, wie heeft het gedaan, wie heeft het gedaan, wie heeft het kızdı kim için ne için ama oldu zaten bunun için ama basit yani. olmasın anne ya yenge hiç kusura bakma abla sen de kusura bakma tamam mı az hün ernit var peki vasik ni so pesi kvist ni to mey peki ma o mama peki o kafin seyit ni der peki ik denk dan van er wurde dinge gezegd peki şimdi bir şey söylüyorsun Tamam mı? Hani Müslümanlığa tamamen aykırı olan, bizim yaşantımıza tamamen aykırı olan bir şey. Tamam mı? Ve e, dat hoi yer uit. Peki. En dan, en dan e, verwacht je dat er over gesproken wordt. Ik, ik, ik, ik, ik, ik, ik snap, niet. nee ik snap jou echt daarom, niet. Daarom doe je er ook zo e, makkelijk over. Omdat nou, jij het niet begrijpt. Ik, nee, maar weet je wat ik niet snap? Jij eigent jou nu iets toe. Jij zegt, ja. je hebt het over iets. Ja. We hebben het over abortus. Ja. Je hebt het over iets dat gaat totaal tegen uh, moslim zijn in, zeg je, tegen ja. ons geloof in, ja. tegen ons uh, waar wij voor staan in. Ja. En dat vertel je gewoon en dat vertel je zo makkelijk, zeg je. Ja. En hoe kan je dat zo makkelijk zeggen? Want, en dan heb jij pijn over en dan ben jij pissig over. En ik zeg, ja, ja maar ik denk dan, jij, doet dan jij, jij zegt tegen mij, hoe kan je zo makkelijk doen? Terwijl ik denk, hoe praat jij zo tegen mij? Het is mijn kind. Het is mijn abortus, het is mijn lijf, het is mijn eenzaamheid, het is mijn offer. Snap je? Dus hoe durf je zo tegen mij te praten? Alsof het makkelijk is voor mij. Alsof het geen ruk voorstelt. Hoe durf je wat voor mij is, wat ik altijd bij me heb gedragen, wat ik moest offeren, omdat ik haar pijn deed, terwijl zij later tegen mij zei... Oh, maar ik had mijn zussen en ik was blij ja. dat ze achter me stonden. Ik niet. Niet omdat zij gemeen was. Maar omdat ik zag dat ik haar kapot maakte. En ik niet wist hoe ik dat moest doen. En dan zeg je tegen mij. Je eigen mijn. Wat van mij is, pak jij. En zeg jij, hoe kan je zo makkelijk doen? Dat is niet van jou. Nee. Is niet van jou, is van mij. Van mij. Ja. Wat van jou is? Heb je gelijk, weet je? Dat is van jou, zeg jij. Ja? Wat je hier deelt, is van ons allemaal. Nee, is van ja. mij. Deel. Dat stukje was van mij. Dat is wat ik in wilde brengen. Dat is wat ik te zeggen heb als kind dat opgegroeid is. Tussen mensen die allemaal van elkaar houden. En ja. het echt goed met elkaar hebben. En willen hebben. Heel veel voor elkaar over hebben. Maar alleen maar praten vanuit regels, regels. Snap je? Dat is het. Well, yes. Um, would you like to, uh, Nazmi or I'll open, uh, have some opening remarks? 
And as you, I'm sure you all agree, the film is just really hard hitting and, <coughs> and wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for watching and thank you, um, yeah, that we are here. Thank you, Mariam Namazi, uh, for bringing us here together because you are facilitating an important part of truth seeking, um, touching on the so-called sacred, fuel, warmth, belonging, the knowledge that you're not alone. Here we can experience an important part of our humanity that some of us have lost or are dearly longing for, to be part of, to live, to belong to a family. We as women are born healers. I don't say this lightly. I don't say this romantically. There is a reason we are the porter to life. Moving with the cycle of the moon, we transmute collective pain. We are alchemists. And it is our duty to touch the sacred with our intelligent, intelligence, our light, our heart, and our feminine experience of life. And we have to be brave enough, entitled enough, love ourselves enough to refuse to give up our space in the family we were born, the society we grew up in, apostasy, being a dissent, dissident, being so-called rebellious is nothing more than our love for our community and traditions and that we have a different vision for it. As it is the right of other people to shape these rules, it is also our right to co-create these traditions for future, future generations. But to be whole, is to touch and hold space for all that you are. To be a true alchemist means to learn to transmute pain and darkness, to be able to stay in reality, to claim your space as your birthright. And most importantly, to honor the womb that gave you life. Yes, this is the most difficult part. This womb could be a mother, family, or a country. Because without this, there would be no you. And without this acknowledgement, there's no touching the sacred. For without this, you only touch other people's so-called sacred, and not your own truth, your own righteousness, your own pain, your own thinking. Touching the sacred means nothing is sacred, and nobody, especially ourselves, are off limits. But I do know that we are equipped and bold enough to go where no man has gone before. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Nazmia. I guess what, uh, there's a lot of questions I would like to ask on Blasphemous Woman, Touching the Sacred. This is the topic of this conversation. And in the opening, we talked about the fact that the very fact of being a woman in and of itself is an act of blasphemy. Before a woman has even spoken, before a woman, woman has even expressed herself, uh, the very fact of being female, her hair, her eyes, her voice, her body, is an act of blasphemy. And that's why I think throughout these two days, we have seen so much blasphemy through music, through art, through our conversations, through our films. And I think they are very key in helping to change the world really for the better. But I wanna first carry on with you, Nazmia, because in, in a conversation we were having last night over dinner, um, with a very rude <laughs> person. Um, you talked about something called parhesia, which I had never heard of. Uh, but you talk about its importance in us being blasphemous and, 
and being our true selves. So I'd really like you to explain what that's about and what it means. Paresia is called. It's truth speaking with risk. The risk can be, you know, being shunned, but it can also mean uh, that the relationship you're in is no longer. <laughs> because uh, you can uh, do paresia with uh, your neighbor, nations can do it together, or you do it with your parents, with your lover. And it is, for me, the highest form of being because um, I did it with my mother and I didn't know. And then afterwards I realized, sorry, <coughs> I, real, I realized there are, there are steps to it, like, uh, I have like five steps, you know, a method. There's a method for it. And, um, and my experience is uh, it's beautiful because when you go through it, uh, you realize you can be of complete opposite size, of complete opposite thinking, and you don't have to say goodbye. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And I guess on this topic of, of um, blasphemy, I mean, I think one of the things that we've been talking about through to, throughout these two days is how important women's blasphemy is. Sorry, did you want to continue? Yeah, I was a bit preoccupied of not being a burden because the water was coming in. So to get back to your question, why I did say it yesterday was because <clears throat> I am so grateful and so in awe of all of you Truly, I am. And I always feel like a little bit, um, I always have like a little bit, uh, how do you say it? Uh, um, I feel not as courageous or I'm like, oh, I, I, I don't have a difficult time or, you know, like that. Yeah, yeah, but, you know. And, uh, um, but when I see us, so now we are family, so now I'm going to do Palacia. Um I see the, the, um, how easy it is also to stay in our pain because sometimes it is the only thing we have or to be so in opposition uh, and if you have lost so much, it is so difficult to take responsibility and to say, okay, now I have to face myself or, you know, um, but that's what I wish upon us. That's what I wish for us to be whole, to be complete, and to take responsibility and to really, truly grow up. Yeah, that's why I said Paresia. Paresia. Thank you. How do you spell it? Uh, I think uh, P-A, yeah, uh, now I'm going with my Dutch. Double R, E, -A oh, H, okay. So here we go. We will, uh, we will. E-S-I-A. Uh, yeah, we will Google it, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So let me uh, go to you now, Nadia. I mean, we're, we're having this discussion on, um, you know, blasphemy, women's blasphemy. And one of the things that we, we see how obsessed religions are uh, with controlling women's bodies and sexuality, like we saw on, on the issue of abortion, for example. Why do you think that is? Oh, there's a mic there. So, Mariam, for me it's a trap, you know? <laughs> because you know that I never use the term blasphemy. Mm -hmm. For me, you know, uh, you, you, you can use it only when you are under believing a religion, you know, a god or something. Because from my point of view, my part, the way uh, I am in the world, you know, I am never, bl bl I never blaspheme, you know? I'm just telling what I think, you know, and for them it's maybe something that they, they... So, I wrote, we only blaspheme in the eyes of those who want to impose us through a religion, a way of thinking, a way of behavior, a, a way of life, etc. So, we are subversive, okay, because it's the only way to make ourselves heard and understood and to start the debate, you know, for me. The real debate we need is the one of the question of freedom, citizenship, equality, justice. And in fact, this debate for me 
must need to prove that only the principle of laicity can allow to live free and equal. This debate for laicity in France begins in, uh, no, not begins, uh, ends in 1905. And it was among, among the, the power of the church, the political power of the church, because the church has money, you know, and why they want to keep the power, it's because they own money with that, like the mosque now, you know. So, it's why they want to keep the power. But I think, Nasser, I think only the people have the power. I, I would like to remind that it was a woman, Kehna, you know, that uh, who stood up against the Muslims, Arab invasions of North Africa. So don't forget that, you know. And in the history, in North Africa now, nobody says it's a blasphemy, you know, to speak about La Kehna, and nobody says it's not true. Everybody's okay with that, you know. So, but I also don't forget that in Tunisia, it was a man, Tahar Haddad, who in uh, 1930 wrote a book, uh, Our, Our Woman in Islamic Legisl Legislation on Our Society. He campaigned for the modernization of our country, you know, through the emancipation of the woman. And it wa he was a big inspiration for Bourguiba to abolish polygamy, it means, in 1957. And also authorize the abortion in Tunisia before France, you know, in 1970. So maybe we have to think about that, that we, we were not uh, at the same level than, than now, so we have to know our history, you know. Mm -hmm. In uh, and I don't like to use mm -hmm. the term of our enemies, you know. So I never use blasphemy. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't have to be sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, there is an argument. Uh, your argument is completely legitimate. On the other hand, there's also the argument that you know, using terms like kafa, like ex-Muslim, reclaiming words and actually highlighting their positives, because I think blasphemy is a very positive thing. And from the point of view of the religious, it's bad, but from my point of view, it's a great thing. And it's very much um, important for, for human progress. And I think, you know, the, the, this whole idea, well, Nazmia opened it up on touching the sacred, on women doing that in particular, um, and us knowing our history, as, as Nadia mentioned, you know, the fact that there have been women before us, and there will be women after us. You know, uh, what's your take on this, Halima? On this idea that why the why religions are so obsessed with women, and why women's touching the sacred, if you don't like the term blasphemy, is so key. First of all, one of the my biggest reasons for leaving Islam was because I'm a woman, simply. Um, and when women just by leaving already you're blaspheming as you know because the whole religion it seems like some men got together and that this is how we're going to control women like I know that's simplifying it but um, now when you as a woman you you you touch that sacred there's so many layers of control that you have broken and that is very very threatening I guess, in that regard. So for me, I feel like even when men are pushing against it, they, they don't have to fight the, the, the, the one that is actually, you know, the patriarchy, but, but I mean, they have to fight the patriarchy, but they, it's not like the pushback is not coming at them because, because but for women, the pushback is coming at them because not only are they brave and, and, and taking care, taking autonomy of their body and, and staying in their own body and saying, this is mine, you don't touch it, but uh, they are also like telling other women to do that or it's okay to do that and showing that example and that unravels the whole, uh, how dangerous it is to the religious cl clerics. At least that's my take on that. And Yasmin, you, um, you've talked about um, well, you know, your music 
and your words yesterday and today. I mean, this whole idea of um, fighting for women's bodily autonomy and this need of religion um, to control women's bodies and sexuality and equating control of one's own body with the same as other people controlling one's body. Um, and, you know, this sort of, you, you, I think you touched on all of these yesterday, so we'd love to hear more on that, and particularly in the context of blasphemy and touching the sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to say that blasphemy is good in religion, and all the prophets did bla like blasphemous acts to start their religion, starting from Abraham, Abraham who uh, uh, destroyed the, um, the statues or the gods uh, to prove that they are not um, uh, they can speak, they can defend themselves. They, like it's so, the prophet is attacking the religion before, before him. It must be a him. Um, so without blasphemy, you say blasphemy, right? Okay, without without it, uh, there's no development. There is no change, and it's been used by everyone since uh, people knew civilization. So it's not a new uh, invention that we are doing. It's uh, just someone who has a new idea and is, a, again, it's the, the former idea. No, nothing is wrong with that. Muhammad did that, like everybody did that. Um, so about women, um, it's very weird. Like um, in a way they respect their mothers and they don't respect the other women. And uh, I can't, with my uh, practical mind, I can't process that because it's um, two opposite ideas. And it's again, it's logic. Um, but to say like, um, um, forget about my logic, it's about to show power. Uh, a man can show that he is strong by making his wife or daughter or sister cover. And if, he's, if he doesn't do that, then um, he's not a man, he's not strong. Um, the, the beginning of that, I know that, um, I don't know, like thousands of years ago, people thought that women were um, the reason of life. They didn't know that women become pregnant because of sexual intercourse. For them, she was a weird creature that bleeds and uh, her belly um, uh, has like something growing and then she gives a baby. So th she's, the, she's the God, she's the creator of life. Once they realized that the man has a role in that, it was fucked up. <laughs> and then they started to uh, follow their genes. Like when they say women cannot have sex with many men, it's for uh, keeping the family name, not the gene, not the genetics, not the biology. In Islam, um, a semen is not relevant to have the baby as your baby. You know, like uh, if, uh, if you, if if the two couple are not married, then the baby is not the, the man's baby, son or daughter. They must be married. And if she's not, uh, if they're not married, he can marry his daughter. Because she's not, like, marriage, the Islamic marriage contract, is the reason why she is written by, uh, in his name. Not uh, semen, not genetics. So he can, um, he can marry his, uh, his uh, daughter. So it's all about power. Also, Muhammad changed marriage from um, women marrying many men. He stopped that, and he made men marry wom many women because there was gawaz al rahat, rahat marriage, where women can have many husbands, and she choose uh, the father of her baby. And actually, I don't care who's the father. I know it's my baby. It's your problem, <laughs> if you want to know. <laughs> So, so they have nothing to do rather than like violence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, it was uh, must be because uh, women were fragile at some moments because of pregnancy, so they took advantage of that. They took their chance. Like uh, like like life is shit. Like I can't I can't understand it because whenever I because um, I discuss with Muslim uh, a lot. Um, Whenever we talk about violence against women, um, again, like um, a, a husband beating his wife, 
and I asked him, do you accept that for your sister? He said yes. But when I asked about his mother, he said no. So there is something um, contradicting, and I, I would like to have that interpreted from someone who has uh, more information or more logic, or I don't know, more experience than me. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Now, um, Zara, I guess uh, it's, it's it w I know you listen to a lot of and argue with a lot of the apologetics, you know, of, of Islam. Um, and when it comes to women in particular, and um, this idea that women are to blame, uh, that's quite, quite central, isn't it? I mean, if you're not veiled, then you can cause earthquakes and rivers running dry. And, uh, you know, AIDS and COVID is all because women in Iran, for example, didn't wear the veil properly and didn't listen and do as they're told. There is always this, for every calamity, women are blamed. And as you know, you know, hell is filled with women, according to Muhammad. So this sort of blaming women, but particularly, it's not all women. It's, a, it's most women, but it's women who don't abide by the rules. So if you are silent, submissive, and obedient, you, it's fine. But it's for everyone else. And I think if you want to live today, you are going to disobey in some form or the other. So give us your take on, on that. So it's no surprise that, you know, a lot of atheists or ex-Muslims who are vocal are mostly men because when women talk, they're always shamed. They're always guilted, they're always um, cursed on. But even when men get the criticism and hate, it's always arguments against their mom, their sister. It's always their, their, our bodies, are my, our bodies only exist as um, a form of sexual exploitation when, they, when they're thinking of like, you know, putting us down. So even when women come on stage, it's always like, oh my God, you're fat, or you're, you know, for me, it's like, you're short. Um, but uh, even even from like, um, yeah, so, so it's always like arguments about how we look, what we do, and very, very quickly that becomes like, if I say I'm an ex-Muslim, oh, you just wanted to be a whore. That was the first thing on their mind. You just wanted to be a whore, wear skimpy clothes, etc. It's like at every point they know that it is women who are holding, who, who can make a society and break a society. The moment women, st women stop conforming, they know that, you know, they're not gonna have those Muslim kids or religious kids anymore. They're gonna be atheists. So we get so much more heat than, you know, the rest, like I guess other atheists as well, including death threats, of course, like that's normal. A lot of us have fatwas on their heads and whatnot, we've seen that. But it's, it's so incredibly, Annoying that like every day you, you you could be fighting with Muslim women and their fight and the first thing they'll say Oh, you're naked and I'm like, oh is my hair naked? You know is um, Yeah, so I, I, I think it just goes around to say that like women kind of hold the space um, To really be able to make the change Iranian women leading the march and You know the men supporting them because they know how vital it is for um, the society, like their progress, because women's rights really highlight the violations that Iran is responsible for. Um, I don't know what I was gonna add. I, I forgot to take my ADHD medication. <laughs> don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for conversation. I mean, uh, talking about this thing that the minute you're unveiled, you're, you're naked. I mean, I think that's a perfect reason for why we do topless and nude protests, because, you know, if you don't know what naked is, let, let's just show you. There's a slight difference, you know. Uh, so, so, sorry, I just remembered. Go ahead. Oh, it, it, was, it was also the concept of honor. The concept of honor holding us, specifically women, accountable for the entire family's uh, reputation. Men can do whatever they want. In the same family, men will go out drinking, dating, bringing women home. But the moment a woman even just talks to a boy, oh my God, you know, it's it's not blood. It's like it's all gone. You've ruined our reputation. The woman, if the woman gets a uh, divorce, there's more criticism on the woman than the man who's also getting a divorce. 
you know, if, if the, like for me being an ex-Muslim as well, they're like, oh, it was your mom, they didn't teach you properly. Or like, how could you come out from a Muslim woman's womb? Like as, as though that would make a difference. So it always goes on to just like, you know, the burden of honor is placed on us. So when we leave Islam, espe especially when women leave Islam and talk about it, it's, re it's, uh, it's quite, it's horrible. Like it's worse than like when men do it because then it just goes like, oh yeah, well, you know, it's the hair. It's uh, the simple act of just removing the hijab means you're provoking other women to do it. You're provoking the men to do it. You're provoking the men to harass you. And I, and I think that's, that's like the biggest issue, like, you know, as our bodies are just being claimed by them, we'll tell you what to do. And the moment you stop listening to us, you're a whore. Thank you. Sure. Can I just bring Naz Nazmi in and then uh, this, or let's go with you and then I'll go to Nazmi. Uh, it's like smoking cigarettes uh, to, to talk about religion. But I want to talk about uh, Alia El Mahdi when you said she was the first woman to, uh, um, in e Egyptian to put her uh, photo naked online. No, I don't think I said that. But Whatever, but she's the first one that has this. Um yeah. Okay, Let, let's, I will go directly to the, to the point. There's many, many, many girls who put uh, their naked photos online that we never heard of and nobody want to kill them because they put themselves in a different context and everybody want to meet them and sleep with them and uh, they, they put themselves naked for the sake of um, seducing, seduction. And there's uh, thousands, literally thousands of uh, females who do that. All uh, many years ago, but once uh, uh, Alia said her name and said that she owns her body and she's free, yes. and she posted her photo without sex, yes. without seduction, not for seduction, yeah. they want to kill her. Yeah. So the honor and the shame is not in the body; it's in her choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. A very important point. And I. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think uh, Ina Shevchenko mentioned that yesterday too, about the fact that people are outraged when women take control of their own bodies and use it as a tool for their own liberation. Uh, but I wanted to go back to you, Nazmia, now about this idea that why are religions so obsessed with female bodies? And also this, uh, the, the issue that Zara raised about how women are seen to be extensions of their male owner uh, to be raped or protected depending on how they behave. Um, you know, so I'd like to get your comments on that. Um, yeah, I don't know actually. <laughs> I, I think it's control, you know, because the question is actually about how humans operate. Mm -hmm. And we have this, uh, uh, as, as my uh, co-speaker uh, said, um, once there's the womb and you are the portal to life and you are the portal to the, the uh, you know, the bearer of the name, you are the portal to uh, that which can inherit your possession, which is an extension of you, you have to control that, of course. Um, and you know, if women are, would be, um, I mean, I, s I really sound like a feminist, <laughs> but, uh, and I don't care, but usually I don't see myself as feminist or whatever. But, um, you know, if women would really be uh, weak, why the need, not only of religion, but the West, the whole world, why the need to control it? Why the need to, you know, you can be a columnist uh, man, and you'll get attacked, but if you're a woman, you'll be butchered, you know, if you dare to speak. And it's not only with religion, it's globally. And in religion, of course, there is extra righteousness and extra reason and, uh, I don't know, verses you can, you can point to, even though maybe you don't even know Arabic, uh, the old Arabic, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I think the answer is simple uh, because humans, uh, in this, in this instance, males uh, want to control, mm -hmm. and um, maybe <laughs> rightfully so <laughs> because <laughs> times are changing, guys. 
it's now time for the matriarchy, and uh, yeah, it will come now. <laughs> Nadia, um, I mean, yeah, I, I do agree, uh, Nazmia, that it is, uh, I think, one of the important reasons is um, the control of the reproductive process. Um, but Nadia, since, you know, we keep hearing about religions and how anti-woman they are, all of them, so the question is when gods are against women, uh, it's natural for women to be against gods. Uh, and what your take is on, on that? It's strange, you know, because I think around the world, it's, it's more the woman that they continue the, the preservation of the religion, you know? And uh, because, they, because the man told them that they are in charge of education of the children, so they did it, you know, since a long time now, and they continue this work. But uh, I'm agree. I agree with you. You know, it's it's a question of patriarchy, you know, a patriarchy around the world, you know, because men kills women every day around the world, uh, domestic violence, sexual violence, and everything. So I think. I, n I never, I never, f I never want, and I never felt as a victim. You know, I don't want to complain anymore. Uh -huh. I, I really, yes. really, I'm sorry to say that because I know it's very important to testimony about what we lived, and I, I made movies, you know, I know what I did, you know, and, but I think it's very important to, to keep in our mind that we are warriors, you know, we are warriors for peace, we are warriors for uh, citizenship, freedom, justice, <laughs> equality, and this is more important than to, to take all this time to talk about this fucking religion, you know? <laughs> I don't care. A lot of people, when I made, you know, neither Allah nor Master, that it changed at, as laicity, inshallah, and a, a lot of people in France say to me, but you read the Quran? No, I didn't read the Quran. I don't want to read it, you know? I don't, I don't need it. I know it's a bullshit, you know, and the Bible and the Torah and everything that want to impose something to me, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I have to, to, to struggle against it. Mm -hmm. So for me, we have to struggle for, I'm sorry to repeat, you know, since 10 years, <laughs> we have to struggle for positive, you know, debate, positive struggle. It's for laicity. I'm sorry to tell you that we can win something. It's to make the debate on the world to all the people, to all the countries, you know. It's about the laicity. When we were at the conference in Paris, we make an appeal that we call the, the, the Paris appeal, I think, yes. I'm not going to read it f because it's too long, but please, you, if you can read it, since I'm speaking, because it's not very important what I'm saying, you know, but <laughs> this appeal is very important. At the end, you, you will find a QR code, then you can, uh, uh, scan. Scan. Yeah. Scan. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and you can sign and you can bring it to your association in your countries and everything. And, and really, I think this is, uh, laicity can, you know, um, brought us together for a simple thing, you know. And we need to have two or three slogans, you know, around the world and always repeat it. One of them, was at the conference, laic of the word unite, you know. Mm -hmm. I know it's something like reference to Marx, but you know, I can yeah, I can't be reborn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I am from communist family, so I'm <laughs> okay. Thank so you. Let's go. Thank you. Yes, and that was from our uh, conference uh, that we did jointly, Council of Ex-Muslims with Laïcs Sans Frontières in Paris uh, in December of last year. Um, and so, I mean, I think 
uh, the issue, uh, I think we've got just a few minutes more and then we're going to open it up to your questions and answers and interventions. But just to wrap things up, and I'd like to get um, you know, any of your points of view, is this idea that, uh, for, from my perspective at least, women's blasphemy is a very positive thing. It's actually talking about how we need to be touching things that are no-go areas. And throughout history, it is by touching the sacred, those things that are no-go areas, that things have changed for the better. And laicite, of course, the fight for a separation is hugely important for women's rights, for minority rights, LGBT, right, LGBT rights, everything. But also touching the sacred, I think, is hugely important. Um, and particularly for women to do it. And while um, I think Nadia made an interesting point that it's a lot, a lot of the times it's women who are helping to maintain religion, but also but a lot uh, of the blasphemers are women as well, you know? Yeah, but so so yeah. let's hear from, yeah, let, I'd like to hear from each of you before we open it up on just this or any other issue that you want to talk about. Thank you so much. Start. Um, thank you for um, having the presence to say, uh, okay, I want to answer your question, but by the way, I don't want to answer your question. Thank you, because I've been... I was still being like in service because I really want to be in service and then I go there. But then I'm reminded that I don't want to uh, say why are women oppressed by religion or whatever. Um, for me, that's the same uh, system as in abuse. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at sexual abuse or whatever, um, it's internalized. Uh, hate and misogyny, of course, but it's also uh, this abusive system that makes the abused abuser, uh, you know, and you, you recruit uh, like uh, the captive uh, holders. <laughs> yeah, you pass it on. Um, and I also, just one last remark, because of your remark. Um, for me, being feminine, um, which is an act of rebellion uh, and blasphemous maybe, but it's because um, everything that has to do with the heart, with a little bit of softness, with a little bit of maybe not black and white, but trying to understand, uh, being a teacher, being a nurse, being a cleaning, taking care of people, everything that is considered feminine is of low value. And that's for me, it's very interesting and very important for me to bring more of the feminine values into the world and to redefine those values as more valuable than, oh wow, you can make a lot of money or oh wow, you are like a go-getter, you know? Um, that's why I'm stressing the feminine uh, uh, the femininity so much because I really think we as humankind uh, really are in need of more femininity because we are completely out of balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I like that you said, I don't want to complain anymore. And I <laughs> uh, earlier I read a poem and a lot of people thought that I'm still like in that. But to be honest with you, I've processed that stuff for a very long time, right? I was six years old, I'm 43, so imagine. And, and, and I don't like being defined in terms of that victim. And that is a thing that rings true for all of us because the thing with rebellious women, from whether they've rebelled from religion or whatever, uh, when you're rebelling against things that are imposed on you, is every step that you take and you have rebelled against and you've gotten your power back, you don't want to be defined by that. You want to be defined by the, all the many other things you've grabbed your power back for, like what you are, uh, I think. I just wanted to make that point very clear. Final comments, but just a few more yeah. comments, yeah, uh, and then we'll open it up. How do you bring about women's liberation? And um, I think through blasphemy is one way, laicite is another. Uh, but real liberation, you know, how how does that come about? Because when we're talking about women's blasphemy, 
I think very much so that it's positive. It's a grabbing power. It's taking away the power of religion that says you're an extension of a man. You're just you know, in the service of men. Uh, you are an extension. You are a man's honor. You are a deviant form of man. Your, your place is in hell if you're not silent and obedient. So the rebellious women, disobedient women, blasphemous women is a way of taking our power back. Uh, you know, so how, do we, how, how does that connect to women's liberation? When, when I start to make movies, you know, a long time ago now, uh, I decide that I will never hide that I am homosexual, that uh, I always uh, put in my fiction a character of a gay woman, you know, or gay man, I don't know, but I always... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you register in my phone. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and I, uh, I decide to always put character of woman winner. You know, it was like decision, you know. So uh, after I made a lot of documentary, but I think in my documentaries, it's obvious, you know, uh, I, I always uh, answer to those questions, you know. And, and I was always fighting for that. I made a movie uh, about feminine, with the feminine. And I was with them, you know, in their struggle in the street, and we were beaten by the police. But I never complained. I never, not like Caroline Forez going to the television and saying, oh, they beat me, you know, the fascists. And, you know, we know the fascists beat us, you know. We know the, the, the, the, the thing they do, everything, everywhere, everywhere. But I, I don't. It, it, for me, it's better to show, maybe this is very American in my mind, you know, it's strange for a daughter of communist, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, you know, to show positive people, mm -hmm. it's a way to, to it's a, a manner to, to, to, um, to show the way to the people, you know. We can be hero, you know. Another song, please. <laughs> we can be hero. <laughs> no, no. <Sarah>. It's, <laughs> but you know, no. <laughs> I want, uh, I want us, you know, to be hero. It's why I said we we don't have to m complain anymore. You know, we have to fight for our right, and our right it's to ask for equality of uh, respect. Thank you, know? you Nadia. Oh. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to Zara, but I do want to make a comment too, is that I think uh, oftentimes when women speak about fundamental issues, it's considered complaining or gossiping. And I think the reality is that we can talk about things that are fundamental in women's lives. It's not about complaining. It's about really looking at why things are, why, why things are as they are and then trying to find solutions on how to combat it and doing it from a place of power, not as a victim, but as those who are trying to investigate and bring solutions and also change our own lives and the lives of others. So I think it's okay to talk about the issues that we face. You know, we need to, to some extent, and that's not the same as complaining. Zara. Actually, this ties in really well with what I was going to say. Um, in the previous conferences, I've always criticized Western feminism because, you know, moving to the West for me meant that, oh, progressive values, oh, you know, women are liberated or et cetera, as compared to what I was raised with. And my biggest shocker was that Western feminists had this tendency of using culture or not talking about Iranian women as a part of, you know, you know, this is okay for Iranian women because, you know, it's their culture, you know, it's their values. We shouldn't, we shouldn't offend it. We should accept it. We should, re you know, we should respect religion. And it may come from a good place, but they have a tendency to coddle us not empower us, they tend to victimize us more. And then when women like us go on the stage and we talk about it and we're like, hey, we deserve more. We need, to, we, need, we need you to stand with us as feminists, to fight with us for our rights. We're, not ta we're always labeled with Islamophobia, etc., And that is something that we constantly have to battle. We constantly have to battle. And like, you know, I'm told that I don't like white people. 
And uh, that's not the case. It's also because, you know, I want to bring in, I want to bring in that perspective that like people like me don't deserve any less rights than people like you, right? We sh if you want to go out without a male guardian, then why can't the Saudi women have it? And why are we glorifying that, oh, women can drive in Saudi now, Saudi is amazing, it's being progressive. No, feminists are still being arrested. There's, uh, there's being arrested. Thank you, Zara. Yasmin? Oh, I was like, I was gonna We're, we're gonna carry on uh, with Q&A, so just some final words and then they'll, uh, we'll open up to them. Okay, um, men never allowed women to say anything. That's just a blasphemy or religion or whatever. Uh, she's uh, hey, like it's humiliating for them when women speak in anything because she's uh, she's not uh, she doesn't have the same IQ like him, so she she's not allowed to do that. And uh, of course, we know God uh, created menstruation cycle for women, and that makes her filthy. So how could the women do have this blood and speak? And I, I, I would like to know why did God do that? Like why did they create mi ministration? And then like shame us with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's let's open it up now to questions and answers. We'll start with uh, Jenny and then Jimmy, please, and then Jamal, and then Khadija, and then oh, Mina. Oh, le le sorry. Let me get Mina first because Mina Hadi, sorry, is the uh, founder of the Council of Ex-Muslims of Germany, and f you have to translate five words. And um, I can't speak German. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. You Just translate. translate. Yeah. Okay. I know, but I'm the chair. I'm already not doing a good job, let alone oh, translate. Lies. Lies. Lies. Man, Mina Hadi, has to as Alman madam. Amina Hadi, I'm from Germany. Man, two to don't yara di dam chon shast to half salam. I've seen uh, two worlds because I'm 67. قبلن اگر میخواستیم در مورد حقوق زنان سرکوب زنان غیره و اینا حرف بزنیم بالاخره میتونستیم در چارچوب اینکه سنت فرهنگ نمیدم قانون رو باید عوض کرد کار کنیم ولی من دیدم که با اومدن خمینی um, uh, previously, uh, in the previous world, we, uh, I could see if we wanted to talk about women's rights and we wanted to change things, we had to talk about law, you know, religion, all of those. Well, but with the rise of the Khomeini and Islamism, then we, uh, we're facing the guns. Man has jahannam <laughs> I've, I've come from hell. Man sang saro didam to Iran. Uh, I've seen stoning. و این نهایت نفرت اسلامی ها از زنا بود. That's the ultimate hatred of women by Islam. نکته ای که میخوام بگم اون موقع وقتی اولین زن رو سنگسار کردن در ایران گفتم سب کن مینا و اگه دنیا بفهمه ساعت ها از حرکت میستن کارخونه ها از حرکت میستن و بشر یه جوابی به این Islamist high terrorist media. When I first saw the uh, stoning, I thought, look, let's, if the world finds out about this, the, you know, the clock will stop, the world will, uh, you know, the, the factories will start working, and the, you know, humanity would respond to this. But when I came to Europe after 10 years, uh, uh, while I was a Peshmerga in Kurdistan, دیدم این دنیا یه جور دیگه تیک میزنه. من تو کنفرانس جهانی زنان شرکت کردم 35000 زن گفتن مینا این فرهنگ شماست. خیلی عاشون. I, I attended the uh, international women's conference with 35000 women there. They told me that this is your uh, culture. پس ما در مورد یه مسئله سیاسی مهم داریم حرف میزنیم از نظر من. We talking about a very important political issue from my point of view. وقتی زنای ایران اومدن گفتن زن زندگی آزادی حجاب آتیش زدن در حقیقت جواب بسیاری از فمینیست ها را در دنیا دادن when the Iranian woman uh, um, shouted woman life freedom and burned the hijab they actually responded to many of the feminists in the world و من دیدم تو اروپا این اسلامیا اومدن و مثلا ما اکس مسلم رو درست کردیم برای اینکه سازمان های اسلامی رو دولت آلمان دعوت کرد گفت چهار میلیون مسلمان رو انتگره کنید uh, and we, we established Council of Ex-Muslim uh, in Germany because the German government wanted to organize so many millions of uh, uh, uh, and, and work with the Islamist groups uh, and organize them so they could organize the Muslims. I don't want to talk about two 
کار سیاسی مهم که در آلمان انجام میدیم خیلی کوتاه چیزی بگم. I don't want to take your time but I want to talk about two uh, uh, important political issues work that we do in Germany and I want to tell you about this. ما تونستیم توی آلمان کاری کنیم که دولت آلمان 54 سازمان اسلامی وابسته به جمهوری اسلامی رو ببنده. We've, we've done so much work that the, we forced the German government to close down 54 Islamic uh, centers linked to this link link link directly to the Islamic Republic of Iran. من 40 سال علیه اسلامیا فعالیت میکنم. About 40 years against Islamists. و وقتی دیدم که با اره برقی رفتن در مراکز اسلامی رو باز کردند و آخوند و از آلمان اخراج کردند گفتم ایب ندارم مینا بمیر دیگه. Alles ist gut. I worked for 40 years uh, uh, on this issue but when I saw the Uh, they went and opened up the, uh, broke down the doors of these uh, uh, Islamic centers and kicked out the mullahs back to Iran. Then I thought, that's all right, I can die now. I've done my work. ما قدم به قدم باید مبارزه کنیم علیه اینا اگه جمهوری اسلامی تو ایران بیفته مدینه هم راحت تر میتونه تو افغانستان زندگی کنه We have to fight step by step but if the Islamic regime falls in Iran Medina in Afghanistan could live better yeah. ما الان علیه حجاب کودکان در آلمان مب... فعالیت میکنیم به نظر من ما باید در اروپا هم کاری کنیم سازمان های اسلامی رو ببندن جمال هم امروز گفت سر هر خونه اینجا یه مسجد هست Uh, uh, we're working on the uh, uh, banning of uh, hijab for the children in Germany, but we have to make sure that all these Islamic centers are closed down across Europe and kick all the mullahs. Yeah. Thank you. We have to make sure that uh, ch child, hijab, child hijab is forbidden in all of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's the wonderful Mina Ahadi. Now, we're going to Jenny, Jimmy. I still have a few minutes for questions and answers because I'm such a good moderator. <laughs> so, Jasmine, I want to apologize to you. Uh, I want to apologize to you. Why? Because when you, oh. asked me, when you asked me about or when you mentioned what I said about Ali al Mari, I noticed that I reacted immediately from my spine. Uh, and that there was like a... Like no, you don't need to. But, you don't uh, need but to. I want to explain because it's important for me because it's triggering my trauma. I should have maybe uh, said something in the trauma part before. Because since 11 years now, since we made the first... Uh, uh, since I joined actions for ex-Muslim women that wanted to leave Islam in their Muslim-majority countries, Uh, there's been death threats and attacks like constantly. I lost my jobs, I lost my home, my heart stopped. Like, it's been like a continuous decade of traumas. So when you asked me this, when you, when you said, I immediately remember like from the first start in my spine that I said something wrong now. <laughs> like now I said, um, maybe that she was the first woman and I'm going to be attacked because I'm claiming that this feminine woman or this woman was the first one. Or like Sarah said, like, oh, I'm this white woman and now I'm coming here and saying that I know something about Alia and you're going to tell me that I did not know. Because I'm not ex-Muslim, but I'm a never ever Muslim. <laughs> and <laughs> and lucky, it's lucky you. It's, it's a never This ever Muslim. And yeah. it's been quite a traumatic trip too, so I want to apologize that I responded this Thank way. Thank you, Jenny. You didn't need to apologize. Take it Jimmy. Easy. This is the vulnerability we need in the world Agreed. right now here, this transparency. Um. I didn't see it from that point of view at all. So Jimmy. I just want to point out that two things can be true, right? So um, it is possible. Oh, no, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Min. <laughs> so, so um, you can be you can be a victim of domestic violence, and you can be phenomenal in your mobilization for change. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it needs to be you're either a victim or you're you know something positive. I would hate for our movement to generate 
degenerate into something that was akin to toxic positivity. You know, people aren't allowed to talk about what they went through, uh, which is one of the primary reasons that we're pushing for change because of what the experiences are that we have. So ju that was just a comment on that. But my question, which might be for any of you who have worn hijab, I don't know, uh, maybe for Zara, because you, you run Faithless Hijabi, is that in my work I see uh, a specific level of compartmentalization for people are in the closet. So they have their ex-Muslim identity, and then when they're with their family and the community, they have to kind of compartmentalize that, and they have to be their Muslim persona. But it has always occurred to me that if you're a hijabi, there's an even heightened level of fragmentation in your psyche there, because you're now putting on a garment that actually advertises for a faith that you don't believe in. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you can talk to us about how that might be different for someone who is a hijabi uh, uh, and is an ex-Muslim in the closet, as opposed to somebody who isn't a hijabi and is an ex-Muslim in the closet. I'm going to take a few questions before I um, give the floor to the speakers. Um, Mariam and then Jamal, please. OK. Um, hi, everyone. Um, mine is not um, more of a question, because I think Jimmy already tackled that. Um, mine is more of a little bit of um, a, um, more like a contribution or an awareness of some sort. Like, for instance, w one thing I've noticed that has really given me a whole lot of challenge, um, you know, coming out being myself, is the fact that I have a group of, I have met a group of ex-Muslims who have left behind some specific attitudes, uh, some specific things they feel they are not comfortable with, but then they are still holding on to some specific, ex-Muslim men specifically. Um, they are holding on to specific values that are quite patriarchal, misogynistic, judgmental, and crazy, crazy, crazy all over. So. There are still, sp and they are amongst us, and they, they still do, I'm not saying they, they, they are not here, <laughs> but they are still amongst us, we, we meet with them, they devalue us, ex-Muslim women, they still have that same, you know, that same behavior, same qualities that, that we are all running away from. I think we also need to be, you know, to, to kind of raise more awareness regarding that aspect as well. You've left Islam, but then you're still hold, holding on to all those specific terrible values that all of us are running out, away from. You see us dress up and then we're walking on the street and you're like, oh, oh wh why is your novel coming out? What the fuck is your problem with me? I thought we are all ex-Muslims together and then we are all in this together. How do you still have this judgmental you know, perspective about me and all that. So I think th it's just a contribution. So we also have ex-Muslim men who are a problem to us, who are also not allowing people living Islam to come out fully. But most, some of them don't even know. They will do whatever it is they can to ensure that, you know, they risk our life. We have examples of them down in Nigeria, in northern Nigeria, that has led to a lot of people losing their lives. Thank you very much. This is just an awareness. Thank you. <laughs> Jamal and then... I want to ask a question to Nadia Elfani. I like uh, every time when you talk about uh, laicite, and I support laicite, and I hope every country will have laicite. Uh, but uh, I'm from Turkey, and uh, 100 years after laicite, Islamism won, and laicite lost ground in Turkey. It became like theocratical country in the end. But it was a Muslim country uh, anyway. But now, when you talk about uh, France, a bastion of laicite, when they are struggling uh, with uh, Islamism, like Islamism winning there too. So it has to be some weakness in laicite. Have you, have you some thoughts about it? Thank you. Uh, not yet. Uh, we're taking uh, Khadija and uh, Taha. And is there anybody else? We're going to be done. And you. So Khadija, this lady here, and then Taha, and we're done. I would like to emphasize on the point that Nadia made uh, that uh, women are uh, the staunch, there are women who are staunch supporter of patriarchy and they are holding women back. Uh, whatever I am today, it's because of my mom. Uh, my mom stood for me and she paid a huge price for that. And we know that women who are born and raised in Muslim majority uh, countries or even in Muslim houses, uh, the freedom doesn't come you know, for free for them. Uh, it comes at a price. And on the point that uh, Zara made, I have stopped complaining about Western families not supporting us. I think it's time to hold accountable not only Western feminists, but everyone who claims to be the torchbearer of human rights and you know, uh, women's rights for, for their betrayal of humanity uh, you know, that is so blatant that cannot be ignored. Thank you. Uh, 
sorry, um, Morton, Morton, sorry, just with this lady here, please. And then Ta. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if any of you think r if uh, banning the hijab is really the solution because it could lead to uh, har harsher reactions from Islamists, for example. Okay, thank you. And Taha, and then, sorry, that's it. I'm really sorry. Well, because you're a woman, I'm going to give you a chance. So after <laughs> Taha, then Mada. You are really a feminist. I, I love you. <laughs> so, no, you go ahead. Because we want the woman to have the last <laughs> word. All right. Okay, thank you. No, I, I just wanted to add what Maryam was saying also here earlier. And basically, uh, and this is something that I've always... Uh, uh, uh, struggled with this idea of uh, you know uh, the the religion controlling women and then using patriarchy or patriarchy using religion, uh, which came first or which is you know because they they are both you know complementing each other, and so what are your views on it? Because if you look at one of the oldest stories uh, in religion, it is you know a f fake story nevertheless, but of Adam and Eve and the whole thing about how Adam and Eve you know they were controlled. That that also shows this patriarchal sort of connection. So I mean, what do you, uh, uh, the panelists, think about uh, this idea of you know which one is yes that exactly? <laughs> uh, what what do you panelists think about this this sort of like you know this uh, this idea that is it patriarchy? Uh, because as Maryam was saying that you know when the men become ex-Muslims and there's still that that sort of patriarchal thing remains yeah. with them. And so where, where does this, well, Thank how, you, how do you Taha. respond to that? Nada? Uh, I just wanted to answer to your question, Mariam. Um, <laughs> suddenly, when somebody is leaving uh, the religion or if somebody is atheist or humanist, it doesn't mean it, it, he, he is a feminist yeah. or he's, uh, he understands the feminist is issues and what is important for women. That's sad. Uh, sadly, uh, uh, that's the first one. And um, second one I wanted to tell you, uh, I'm a European woman, not a Western U woman uh, from the Balkans, and I support as a feminist I support you, my sisters. You are brilliant. Thank you, Nada. OK, we, uh, we're ending late, not because I'm a bad chair. I just want that to be confirmed here, but because we started late. But I want to give each of these brilliant women here only one minute to speak each. Uh, yeah. We can start this way. And after that, you're not leaving. Do not even get up of your seats. Otherwise, you, hell is going to pay right here. <laughs> then uh, Halima is going to do her beautiful poetry. We're going to watch a one minute clip from Shabana and we've got our closing ceremony with fabulous fabulousness we're not having a break so just keep your asses in your seats go ahead um, thank you for saying that you res uh, respect us <laughs> very weird thinking thank um, but um, European women uh, they say that we should not like we are racist if we speak but they are silent about the other side, when they say that we are whores because we are not wearing hijab. So it's not uh, good, maybe in a good way they respect, uh, it's out of respect. No, it's a chosen respect. It's not respect, respect is, is, is to be for all. Language. Yeah, and uh, um, I've always been called many, many bad things because of my uh, dress. So why am I not able to speak about her dress too? Like stop, stop them first. I would say that, Sorry, uh, uh, w women wearing hijab are whores until you stop saying that women who are not wearing hijab are whores. <laughs> yeah. That's one way of doing it. <laughs> um, Sarah? I think to Jimmy's question, and this might also answer the hijab ban, when I wore a hijab, it was like a part of me. It was just like every day something that I would do, like my hair, cover it. It was so ingrained in me because I wore it at, young, at a young age. Everybody around me wore it. So when people impose a hijab ban, I don't think they realize that it's such a difficult process. It's so not similar to not wearing a cross. It's so hard to let go. Years after I removed the hijab, I was still on long sleeves, you know, long, you know, covering my neck and everything. So hijab bands effectively are just still putting me back to a place where you're still imposing a ban on something I can wear. I think the better way is to be educated about it 
And you know, with Faithless Hijabi, the name was exactly chosen for that because we see a lot of women, like even in Iran, they have to wear the hijab, but, not e but even in the West, they have to wear a hijab and they don't believe in it. And they have to continue doing it. But because it's so part of your identity, sometimes you don't even think twice about it. You're just like, okay, I'm just gonna put this on, like, you know, I'm just gonna put a hairband, and I'm just gonna go out. And sometimes it's so normalized where you don't think about it, but yearn for that freedom. Thank you. Nadia. No, let me answer to uh, Jamal. You know, after 80 years of democracy in Italy, the fascism came back, you know. You know, in France now, we have a president who doesn't respect the democracy. You know, in the USA, after I don't remember how many years, they tried to forbidden the abortion. So for me, to answer to your question about the Islamists in the power after 70 years of laicity in Turkey, that it's not the same laicity than in France, but it's another problem. Uh, it means only that we have to struggle all the time. Never think, n n n nothing is, how do you say? Nothing is ever acquired. Guaranteed. Yeah, what? N nothing is for granted, you know. Le poète Aragon a dit rien n'est jamais acquis à l'homme ni sa force, ni sa faiblesse ni son cœur. Et quand il croit, you have to brush up on your friends. Ses bras, son ombre et celle d'une croix. <laughs> now we're tired when we're speaking other the languages. <laughs> Halima, what was the final question? comments? Anything on on anything? Final comments. So I still want to stay on the on the thing about that Mariam raised um, about the misogyny even within uh, ex-Muslim communities. And I know the simplest way to say is not everybody who lives is not a feminist, but I'm gonna push back a little bit about that because um, I feel like it's, it's because of the scripture and, the, and, and, and how, how you get raised, both children, male or female, and as you, uh, personally, as I grew up, even when I was six, I knew my brother had more favors and my brother had more freedom and my brother would get away with shit that I can't get away with. So in a sense, it, it also, when these men leave Islam, it, it, there needs to be a really important uh, almost deconversion, not is it, what, what is it, de-radicalization, not de-radicalization, what is the thing I'm looking for? This misogynization. <laughs> process that <laughs> yeah that needs to happen and that process in itself I think it also needs to the conversation needs to be had in a very transparent manner because most ex-muslim men they they also I mean they left Islam so they don't agree with the the the text that that that you know oppresses women and they will say that but they wouldn't, it's very hard for them to admit that they, they still have, you know, implicit, oh, let me even call it, because the one I interact with sometimes is implicit misogyny, which, uh, and it takes years to shed off those. Thank you, Halima. Uh, before I give it to Nazmi, I just want to say there hasn't been a hijab ban in France, for example. It's about the child veiling. Uh, there's also the question of the burqa and security. So I think we have to also be careful to use accurate language because I think the Islamists do keep talking about hijab bans, whereas it's not a hijab ban. But it, that's a very long conversation. So, uh, but I just wanted to clarify that point. Please um, go ahead, Nazmia. Um, yeah, difficult task to end the, this beautiful conversation with you all. Um, uh, I can only say to you what I say to myself every day. I try to be gentle to myself. I try to really look in the mirror, to take my responsibility. Um, and until the day I make true peace with where I come from, <laughs> I'm not done yet. Because it's not about forgiving or whatever. I cannot forgive my parents because systemically they are behind me and above me. I'm their child. It's not my place to forgive them. But I have to bless the place that gave birth to me because then I bless myself. Mm -hmm. 
And if I cannot make peace wi with where I come from, I don't, I cannot excel, I cannot make money, I cannot, I don't, I'm not trying to impose this belief on you guys because I don't want anyone to feel, but this is what, what I realize and what I believe in. So be gentle on yourself. And, really? um, Thank you. Know Thank you. you. Great words. We're not done yet. Sorry. Oh, no, not yet. Um, uh, Halima is going to do a poem now um, called Patriarchy. And then we're going to show a video of it's part of my panel. I'm in control until I go sit there. Do not. We're not moving. <laughs> Halima, where's your where's your poem? have it. <laughs> no, it's true. I have Just anything <laughs> patriarchy. Can I, do you want me to? Okay, I'm going to do it. Even music anything patriarchy. <laughs> the poem is called Dear Patriarchy. So be prepared. Dear Patriarchy, so what's your deal really? Because when I woke, I wondered, hmm, what why exert so much power over my body, my soul, and my vagina? My f and my feisty hot head of rebellion. Bear with me, I'm tired. Dear patriarchy, is it possible that you're a tad bit fearful of me because I do see through you? So you feed me lies, but in my mind I always questioned. And you told me I was less, but in my gut I always doubted. So you had me in chains, but my body, it constantly rejected. So you told me more lies, and more narrative, and more religion, and more society, and more rules. And dear patriarchy, your deception took many years out of my life. I kind of accepted for a long time, at least for some time while it lasted. But my soul, I knew, always searched. And finally, I questioned all that you stand for and the many ways you use supposed to be as a means to keep me chained, not to wake. I looked at your narrative of religion and your masculine God. I questioned your, sorry. I looked at your narrative of religions and your masculine God. Dear patriarchy, newsflash, I am myself. You cannot shut me down. But I give you this much. For a long time, I actually believed you. Dear patriarchy, I'm not yet done. In fact, I'm just getting started. Dear patriarchy, if I, a female, makes you wonder if you should feed me lies, if I, a woman, makes you shudder at the thought of my rise, if I, a lady, gives you tremor with fear of my power, then surely, patriarchy, you should not be surprised that I transcend beyond the limits of your deception. You know why? Because I finally believe that you are indeed threatened by my feminine wisdom. From any, f by my feminine wisdom. That is why you use every narrative possible to make me question my reality. But dear patriarchy, this, this poem is my fuck you to you. Thank you, Halima. Thank you to you wonderful women.